Hi everyone um, and welcome to Go Live from the Applied Innovation Exchange in San Francisco or wherever you are. I'm happy you all could join today. My, my name is Andreas and I will be your host today. Um, so today's theme uh, is Future Thinking Simplified. And uh, we have such an inspiring panel for today's uh, panel discussion. Um, I really encourage you, as Bobby already alluded to, to fire away any questions you may have in the Q&A um, function of the WebEx platform, and we'll turn to uh, them toward the end. But before I introduce the, uh, uh, the panelists, just a brief background on the theme today, Future Thinking Simplified. In a situation which to many is or seems to be quite complex, uh, simplifying and clarifying both thinking and, and actions have never been more important than today. Um, rapid market changes, obviously, and even changing customer expectations and also behavior are fueled by new needs and new technology enablers. Um, many businesses even traditional non-tech companies are transforming into becoming, quote, technology and software companies. Um, success seems to be found in many moonshot efforts and, and um, they, they inspire in their mere conceptual appearances. Some innovation initiatives may risk lead organizations astray. So the landscape of future thinking uh, simplified is indeed vast. So let's explore it uh, with the panelists. Uh, let me introduce to you first, uh, Professor Sally Eves, Professor and Chief Technology Officer, uh, Professor in Advanced Technologies, and uh, Sally is also a Global Strategic Advisor, specializing in application of artificial intelligence cloud, cybersecurity, blockchain, IoT, and 5G disciplines for both business and societal benefit. Welcome, Sally. Thank you, Andreas. Really looking forward to the discussion. I think platforms like this are so, so valuable. Everything you were saying about making it accessible and knowledge sharing, couldn't agree more. So really looking forward to the conversation. Awesome. Thank you. Good to have you. And we have Emmanuel Sardet from uh, Credit Agricole Group, uh, CTO, and uh, also Credit Agricole Group Infrastructure Platform CEO. Emmanuel has an um, impressive 26 years of experience in IT services in the financial services industry, leading cloud technology advisory and outsourcing activities at uh, regional and global level for 17 years. Welcome, Emmanuel. Good to have you. Thank you. Very energized about you know discussing with you all. This is the story of a guy who has been spending most of his life outside his home country, and then now having the privilege to be the group CTO of a really well grounded company, which is a which is life to me. Awesome. Looking forward to exchanging ideas with you, Emmanuel. Then we have Dr. Mark Esposito, professor, PhD, best-selling author, pioneer of the fourth industrial revolution. Mark is a recognized internationally as a top global thought leader in matters relating to the fourth industrial revolution, the changes and opportunities that technology will bring to a variety of industries. Mark, it's good to have you today. Andreas, great to be here. Looking forward to the conversation. I've been looking forward to this for the entire week, so I'm happy this is happening. Thank you. And finally, yes, finally it's happening. And then we have Patrick Nicolet. Patrick is Group Executive Board Member and Group CTO in Capgemini. And as Capgemini's Group CTO and Executive Board Member, Patrick is responsible for setting the overall technology and innovation agenda for the group and has oversight of company-wide internal information systems and cybersecurity. Patrick, welcome to Go Live. Yeah, hello, Andreas. Uh, so happy to be here with uh, such a distinguished panel. Really looking forward uh, to the conversation. So I'll be brief. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Steve Wells, also happy to have you. Steve, global futurist, keynote speaker, and founding director of Informing Choices, international speaker, um, and a facilitator, and a thought leader established and recognized. Steve, it's good to have you. Uh, Andreas and everyone, thank you very much. Good afternoon from uh, 
south of London. It's a very cloudy day, but I anticipate an hour of sunshine and conversation this afternoon. <laughs> Delighted to be here. Awesome. Good to have you. Finally, Carrie Vim Vimia, CTIO uh, Capgemini Invent. Uh, Carrie is the author of the blockchain alternative and the creator of the theory of fragmentation. Uh, Carrie, it's good to have you on this panel. Same here. I'm really looking forward to the conversation and hope that my contribution will be valorized. Thank you. Awesome. So, as you can see, um, attendees, uh, everyone, what a uh, dynamic um, panel we have to explore this future thinking simplified theme. Um, to kick this panel discussion off, um, Patrick, uh, why don't you go ahead and, and craft kind of a first context for us? Uh, what are some of today's essential technology drivers and, and how do leaders already differentiate? Yeah, thank you, Andreas, and welcome everybody. Thank you for taking the time and uh, joining this, uh, this webinar. And uh, in my job and throughout my career, always had a great fun when we were discussing about presenting technology for business leaders because I knew my challenge was to avoid in about three minutes into the conversation, the answer what question. And I think that's what we often see uh, even these days. So we developed a pragmatic approach in three steps to address this question. Uh, first, we believe, uh, and I believe it is important to draw the attention on three principles, three fundamentals of technology. The number one, obviously, is data. Data is the asset, everybody will understand it. The second is security. Uh, in technology, we're all aware of Moore's law, and Moore's law means uh, IT has been developed on performance and cost. Uh, it's not enough anymore. Uh, we see it, especially since the COVID crisis, uh, with the increase in ransomware attack. Security is an integral part that comes on top of performance and cost. And third is more technical, but still very important for the business, are standards. Uh, pay attention to standards. Look for technology that have open standards, otherwise you won't be able to collaborate in the future. And these standards are known like TCPI, that's why we are connected today, or Ethereum for transaction. So what, once you have this, uh, we propose also uh, to look in the enterprise uh, at the maturity level of the different technology domain. I don't think everything is the same. Uh, we, if you look at cloud or artificial intelligence, they are embedded in the enterprise. So this is an evolving uh, area. You have more emerging type of technologies such as uh, immersive, the whole human to machine uh, technologies, collective uh, technologies for the machine to machine, which used to be and decentralized technologies. Uh, such as the blockchain or the peer-to-peer -peer collaboration. And this is emerging and that they are the truly disruptive one. And uh, we don't see many disruptive so far, except of course uh, for quantum computing that will completely change the game. But once you have it as a business leader, what do you do with this? And what we propose is to create some correlation because where, where do you pay attention? So understand your principles, understand the maturity, and, and, and look for the most immediate correlations. Uh, an obvious one, everybody knows, is data and artificial intelligence. I don't need to develop it. Uh, where we see the, the biggest correlation is now between security and the cloud. Uh, why uh, cloud providers do the security of the cloud? You still have to take care of uh, the security of what you do in the cloud. And it's very important when we evolve towards serverless infrastructure, where basically your code is executed somewhere and uh, you don't really know what, and uh, you still have to secure your operations. And of course, uh, even further to quantum, because uh, if you have to keep your data for a certain number of time, uh, then you have to have post quantum cryptography, for instance. So these are the type of correlation uh, between standards and decentralized technology, as I just explained uh, about the importance of standards. And uh, decentralized technology is about, for the enterprise, uh, my roadmap to regain freedom. Uh, because yeah. let's face it, uh, the cloud comes with a lot of lock in. And then uh, the last point, and I will stop there because uh, we have a lot of interesting uh, in, insights that will uh, illustrate these points, uh, is 
contextualize. So the, the whole question about IT is the contextualization. If I take immersive and connected uh, technologies uh, in automotive, uh, when you enter into a connected car, uh, you have an, the in experience. It's between you and the car. But then you have at the same time the car to car. Uh, connectivity, which is not a human to uh, machine type of interaction. And then you have all these cars connected to the infrastructure. And this entire system has to work together. So one thing cannot go too fast uh, if the rest is not following up. And that's where, with this simple structure, uh, we engage and we propose to engage with the executive uh, and again summarize understand there are some technology principles, understand the maturity, and then understand uh, the correlations and the contextualization. And uh, that's the way we propose to shape the conversation. And so far, uh, it's going well. Awesome, thank you. Well, that's quite of a landscape we've already drawn up now with uh, technology enablers, the correlation framework and the contextualization. Uh, you even, I think, already nailed a core question many leaders carry with them, the so what question in all of this, uh, uh, which you refer to then as, as uh, the context and, and uh, the, the value, so to speak, leveraging these enablers. Um, Emmanuel, I, I, I can't help but uh, connecting this to some other conversation we've had in, in, uh, in the recent past. Um, the the context, the correlation into the core values of the bank, the company, corporation you, you're a part of and that you lead. When you look at the relevance of applying technology like the ones Patrick outlined, um, to be to applying it to be more connected to the customer meeting, maybe new customer expectations, how, how do you consider uh, what technologies matter most and, and where to invest and how to do it? Yeah, I mean, uh, absolutely. I mean, the, when coming back to the so what, I mean, the so what can you can get bring that on the table because you know we we are literally living in a paradoxical area. I mean, we can we can say and we we are now saying within the bank that that sad period of the coronavirus accelerated literally the adoption of all the digital channel, new technology, etc. Sure. By far, I mean, beyond every. Uh, thought every dreams we had before planned in our strategic plan, but however we see here and there our customer we are connected to asking for delaying the adoption of the 5G for another year before oh. you know stuff like that. So that's literally a paradox. And then we are now really convinced about how legacy, uh, you know, the way we are connected to those people locally. Uh, the the you know the the reason for being what we're calling the raison d'être of the company, which is being of use to those people and the society in their daily life locally, means there is no game change about only the the technology. Any disruption will yeah. have to bring value to those people, and so it's question of society, it's question of life, it's question of regulation public country culture. So the, the thing is, if we were to, you know, to invest 100, we are now believing that we need to invest half of that and how it will connect to those people, you know, matching, connecting with our core value and, you know, doing the breakthrough stuff with the technology on the other side. But definitely it's not about you know, being a technology company and it happens that we have a banking license. I mean, we know now that it's not, it's not our future. It's not going to be the future, not the yeah. future of the country. Uh, we know that we've been there for years. We will be there, not being we will be adopting the technology, but we are connected to those people and those people are connected to us. And this is what we are cheering. We want to protect. So, I mean, that's our strategic agenda today at the bank. Hmm. Thank you. I think it's interesting, the reflection. We go from technology into so what, and then the societal opportunities and challenges, so the types of conversations that, uh, that uh, now 
this technology enables and, and perhaps accelerated by a global crisis that we're seeing now, what that actually means. Uh, some, of course, I, I believe we believe answers to many of the challenges are found in technology, and, and then we still to may have to maintain uh, focus on the core values, for example, for the bank or for the company organization that, that, that we're part of. Um, but Sally, I think this is uh, also some uh, thoughts and ideas you've been thinking about for, for quite some time uh, regarding the dynamic and, and value-driven emerging technology capability. Uh, kind of weave woven into uh, tech for good and 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 combine it with growth. What's your perspective on all of this? Well, yeah, I couldn't agree more with Emmanuel's point just now. For, for me, this is all about growing, sustaining a shared value um, business model. So it's how can we benefit digital transformation for business, but how can we do more than that, <laughs> invest and harness technology for society at the same time? And I think what we've seen over the last few months, the acceleration of innovation around technology, but also an acceleration of where awareness and resonance all around harnessing technology for good. And I know we've talked a little bit about, you know, things that are uh, really we can harness for hyper growth, so AI, blockchain, quantum computing. And for me, what we need to do um, as business leaders is we need to A, recognize what's happening. So it's a really a move that's happening now to more bottom up, decentralized futures. It's ecosystem based, it's platform driven, it's society led, and it's increasingly immersive, for example, with the advance of AI. So it's balancing all these things together. So it's all about recognition, and it's around understanding, and sometimes that's all about changing the narrative. So I think if we think about blockchain probably as a classic example of that you know it's a real example of decentralization in action um, but the barrier has always been that it's been associated primarily with one use case so cryptocurrency for example and the wider application has less less been known so there's been a, a wariness really the hype has got in the way of the actual action how this can be actualized both for business and particularly this interest in embedding trust but also for wider society as well and i think again the covid situation we've seen the fragility of supply chains. We've seen how we must embed, embed trust and transparency. So there's a great opportunity now to let's harness that, let's change the narrative. Um, again, in terms of barriers to making this happen, I would say skills mm -hmm. gaps, absolutely key around AI, cybersecurity and blockchain. And also kind of the classic perennial problem really between IT and business alignment has been going back for 40 odd years. But now and ever more so, we have to have that right to really actualize the technology um, imperative and the opportunity that brings. Um, and again, in terms of changing the narrative, traditionally, when we've talked about things like blockchain, we've looked at energy consumption, and that's been a risk, but it's been so many de developments there. Um, and the energy consumption, the scalability, mm. and the performance has raised so much. So again, it's getting that information out there and showing what we can do. Um, and the other thing I would say is don't treat technology in isolation. It's all about, as Patrick said, right at the, right at the start, set in the context, it's about this technology integration for innovation. We're seeing really now a collective maturity around around distributed ledger technology, around cloud, around security and data. And again, we're seeing that opportunity for the business benefit and the societal one as well. Um, I'm, I'm forgive me, I don't want to talk too long, but the other thing I would also stress is we must embed change right from the beginning of the technology life cycle. So that's mm. building technology with inclusion. So AI is a classic example of that and embedding sustainability by design. We can't retrofit this, it can't be at the end. So if we're gonna really actualize things like the circular economy and, and green, green economy, et cetera, we have to look at that very first part of the life cycle too. Um, and make sure we've got cultural readiness alongside the technology. That's how we can grow and scale. Wow, this is a change on a really wide, really deep scale. I mean, the 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 the, the gamut, the range of topics here you're covering, um, enormous. As a leader in an organization, what what have you seen uh, differentiate uh, in leading uh, these types of changes? Uh, we're talking about emerging technology. At the same time, talent and culture, there are so many different topics. What, what, what have you seen or what are you seeing in terms of, of, of leading change and shaping leadership? And is this one to me as well, Andreas? Just, yeah, just check. Yeah. yeah. Yes, um, yes. For me, sorry, uh, the mindset is absolutely key. So that outward vision, 
that that willingness to be adapting and, and always scanning about what's happening and taking ideas from different sectors, being really aware of that and welcoming that openness and collaboration. And we've seen recently a big rise in social commerce. So that ability to listen to the different types of communities who, who might be your customers now, who might be your customers in the future, but being always open, doing that collaboration and mm. look, reaching people where they are and expanding yeah. those boundaries, not doing things in that traditional way, I think is absolutely critical. Um, mm. And I always talk a lot about STEAM skills, but again, I think that's absolutely critical for leadership. You have to have that emotional connection and awareness, you know, to really connect with people is absolutely key. So I always talk about yeah. how we build skills that are not just technology, it's about communication. It's about emotional intelligence and problem solving skills and empathy. We need that depth and breadth. So I kind of, it's a kind of the rise of the deep generalist in many ways, but we have to have that led by example from leaders throughout our organization. So definitely openness, yeah. adaptability, and that willingness to listen, to go out and, and try different things and do, do that, embed that in your culture and everybody will follow yeah. you. You, know, you have yeah. to lead by that example. Thank you. Awesome. Mark. Uh, I'm keen to hear your uh, perspectives uh, on this. We've been addressing opportunities, challenges, barriers, and neighbors already. Um, also mentioning some emerging technologies like AI and quantum computing even. How, how do we fit all of this together? Which, which way to go, uh, where to disrupt, where to grow, where to change? Great. Well, Andreas, first of all, very happy to, uh, to have heard what Sally has really uh, displayed for us is it was a comprehensive view on this uh, uh, profound transformations that we're seeing right now in the world. I think again, as, as you know, I've been from the inception within the fourth industrial revolution movement that started from the forum. I think this is what the fourth industrial revolution really aspires to really achieve. Is is first of all the fourth industrial revolution does not exist yet. It's not like an institution. It's an aspirational model towards where we'd like to go. I think what is important by trying to put together the conversation that Sally provided and the, the other colleagues in the panel towards maybe your, your point, uh, we have to understand that technology needs to scale for mm -hmm. this, this gap that we see around the world to uh, actually get closed. Uh, we sometimes uh, operate from the perspective of seeing this pioneering trends in the organization or, or entity where we can witness this. But there's a large part, I think, of the world that still needs to make a first step into uh, some form of greed or cloud. Uh, we're estimating about half of the world still is in the dark. And mm. I mean, that's the, one of the greatest opportunities we really have to uh, bring millions of people on board through the power of technology. I think if it, in the advanced economy or in the emerging economy, we are looking at the dichotomy of technology and understanding is it on the good or on the bad side. With countries, they still have to make the first step. We have the unique opportunity to use our collective knowledge to really shape the architecture. And so the emerging econ the emerging technology will be the one that we will create through the ecosystems of innovation. It is hard to know exactly which will be the trends. If you're looking at some of the technologies that Sally was mentioning, they haven't made a lot of progress from 2016 until now because capitals have not arrived. At the same time, COVID has been an eco chamber in which technology that were in the limbo for a while now they have got accelerated and they became uh, a little bit deeper than just early stage of adoption. They're going into some form of the early, uh, early mainstream markets. So I think uh, building ecosystem, generating the right matchmaking between capitals, innovators, and of course, uh, uh, the opportunity on the ground, uh, borrowing the right type of capital from this institution that we are borrowing from to make sure that we're building the civilization of a 21st century, more friendly kind of uh, society is where we're going to see more of the trends in the future and organizations that see this grassroots movement of technologies rising i think they can imagine the frontier technology will emerge so i always find the key is not necessarily in identifying the specific trend but it's more understanding where the culture is taking a whole group of people to innovate and how do you facilitate the integration between technology capitals and of course research so there are some of the things I see happening more and more. Um, I guess from the time, just to finish on this, uh, Andreas, from the time that I started to get passionate about the fourth industrial revolution until now, it's probably the first time where I see this, uh, uh, I see almost like an inkling of what could really become in the future. And I think 2020, of course, is a, is a memorable year in many ways, not necessarily for, for, uh, for just COVID, but I think for a number of different phenomenal experimentation that we have experienced. 
it might have also been the very beginning of this rising new uh, global paradigm that is really going to create a different narrative for leaders, uh, for public policy, and of course, for society at large. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, uh, I think uh, to build on what you're, you're seeing there, um, Mark, um, if we can learn anything from, from history, um, the past few decades at least, uh, when it comes to global crises, um, we, we've seen uh, them uh, as as society and and the businesses uh, come out of it and and go back to recovery and growth, uh, technology has been on a hyper growth or hyper acceleration as it's it kind of uh, drove the need uh, to transact and interact in 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 new ways, and the 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 you know the current situation obviously is also an example of that as as. Uh, new platforms, technologies allow us to do this, for example, and continue working and, and even creating that critical, safer environment for, for us to live in uh, in the current context. So as we look uh, ahead a little bit, uh, hyper growth around technology, new customer expectations um, and behavior um, linked then to the context of emerging technologies, how should leaders think uh, to both address maybe the challenges inherent in all of this, but also to to reach for the opportunities uh, as we see growth ahead of us and and also shaping for the greater good uh, in society. What, what what should be the the motivator, so to speak? So, so Andrea, me, right? I guess. Yes, yeah, yes, yes. Just a follow up question. question. Yeah, yeah follow up. So, Andrea, I think, you know, in the past, we were identifying needs and we were trying to address those needs with a business model. If we were lucky and we were able to get to the market, this business, business model would have actually scaled. I think the same can happen today at a much shorter cycle by using technology as a shortcut to that kind of opportunity to actually match the needs with a solution. So I'm thinking about the large needs we have, the large pain points that we have around the world, and how can we use technology as a way to address those? Because when we address a social need, we equally address an economic opportunity. I think we have learned, uh, especially in the last couple of decades, that there is not really a trade-off between social and economic value. They're part of the same proposition. It's just that we were too busy in looking only at one side of the story or the other. And I think if, if I were like to advise where leaders might want to look is when you look at an opportunity, try to address it with technology because you're going to be able to scale at a much faster pace and bring the same solution to more people around yeah. the world. I think we can really go in so many different directions. So in this case, I think it's more of a bit of uh, of uh, techno optimism matched with some very good hunch on business opportunities and blending them as part of mm. a one one narrative. Mm. Interesting, S Steve. I can't help uh, then uh, uh, go to you. Uh, I, I think about you and then global futurist uh, um, theme here. Um, the situation, obviously, uh, we are reminded every day how global uh, it is, uh, and, and in the situation we are in, everyone. Um, uh, as technology impacts wider and deeper in, 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 in society, uh, culture, philosophy, what kinds of conversations do you see are required to kind of stay the course to a, uh, to a brighter future of all of this? Well, for me, I think, you know, when I look further out, I actually see massive opportunity for technology. So picking up on Mark's point about the social need and an economic opportunity. And, and one of the things that I tend to go back to are the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And I think they represent an absolutely wonderful broad perspective on sustainability. And, and that's, I think, because in the past, maybe we've thought about sustainability as being just about the environment. But what the SDGs do is they really pick up the social nature of the challenge to be more sustainable, the enterprise right. challenge, the way we need to invest in infrastructure, the community investment, not forgetting, of course, biodiversity, climate change. And right. they're all critically uh, critical issues, all of which benefit from the application of technology. But what I think is really interesting is the enabling goal is actually about partnership. 
And I think what's wonderful about that, it really puts at the heart of achieving those ambitious goals, a basic human behavior. So that actually leads me into thinking about it's actually critical to achieve three core things. And, and I'm going to pick up, I think, on things that uh, that particularly Sally and, and Mark has already spoken about to some extent. And the first is this idea about building a new mindset. And we have to really get out of the idea that what's been successful for us in the past is going to be successful in the future. And now I'm going to misquote Einstein, but it was him, wasn't it, that said, thinking the same way as if we've always thought and expecting mm. a different result is mm. insane. And mm. I think if the last six months has taught us anything, it's that we need to do something to create a different result. For me, the other thing is about revising what we need by leadership, what we mean by leadership. And that does pay, need, need us to pay attention to complexity and uncertainty, thinking about systems, looking at the ecosystem, looking at foresight to help us do that. And I want to pick up the word that, uh, that Sally used, empathy, because actually we need to understand what the impact of this change is on people. So I think a lot of the conversations we need to have are really about learning lessons from, from the current and from our previous experiences, like the COVID pandemic, like the financial crisis, and then actually apply those lessons through a future lens. Because we need to make sure that we understand the variable nature of the future, the uncertainty that's embedded in the future, so that we don't actually put all our eggs in one basket. So if we imagine, for example, a future where we get really good at managing the pandemic and there's a buoyant economic rebound, then actually that sets up one set of uh, in one set of an environment within mm. which we put our investments in place and we look at the way that we use technology. If, on the other hand, we have a future where the pandemic is poorly managed, poorly contained, and actually there's a really sluggish, slow economic response, then actually that sets up a different dy dynamic. So what do we do in both those potential futures? Because they're each equally plausible. And I think mm. that's the real challenge. How do we look at the skills that we need to address plausible but different futures? I think uh, super interesting uh, per perspectives and views, uh, Steve. And I can't help by looking at you, Carrie. I know this is uh, these are things you've been thinking about for quite some time. Uh, you know, going back to old normal or the new normal, and all of this. You know, this kind of context. Carrie, what are your thoughts about uh, uh, maybe kind of what a practical framework would look like, enabling you know leaders to consider what technologies to that matter and, and how to go about applying them for for growth and for good the practical framework so i like the fact that you asked me the easiest question <laughs> yes um, i can tell you what we are doing over here because it's something which um, applies to pretty much any kind of technologically led strategy uh, and we use a framework which is known as the visualization of the value chain this is really important for us because the first thing that it does is it starts off with the consumer and essentially traces that entire journey from when they click on an app to where is it going? Where's the data being stored? How is it being processed? All those different components which a business actually has. And when you map this out, it creates a, it's something that creates a, a number of positive effects. To respond to what Sally was talking about narrative, how do you actually create a new narrative? You create a new narrative by creating a, a picture in someone's mind, a metaphor that everyone can, can unite around. And so when you've got this ability to map it out, and you can do this very mm -hmm. simply by getting stakeholders involved and asking the right questions and putting it up over there, everyone's now got a unified image. They now know what the business actually looks like. And if you're going to make a migration to cloud, or if you're going to be uh, using artificial intelligence, where are you using it? You know, one of the things that I, I often get irritated about when I see people talk about technology is that they talk about it in extremely abstract terms. But technology is always applied in specific components of a value chain. You don't just put AI anywhere. You put it on a specific place. So when you do this, what this help, this framework helps you do is it helps you see the possible evolution of your value chain. And in the process of this evolution, you see that everything is connected. Right. Patrick said this in the very beginning. He said the rest is not following up. Mm. The reason the rest is not following up and you spend two million or three million on a park which never sees the light of day is mm. because you haven't taken that into consideration, how they are actually interconnected. More importantly, it allows you to see the bottlenecks that get created and how you can actually solve them. It helps you understand how new opportunities are going to be created and what are the essential growth strategies that come along with it. 
through the application of this technology and makes it very, very specific as to how we need to go about it. So if you want to have this ecosystem kind of perspective, that's really what we're trying to do over here. An ecosystem is not, you know, existing in vacuum. Your company exists within it. So how does your company actually look? Can yeah. the technologies over there, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the framework that we use. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um view there on the framework and 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 rallying the leaders and the organization around a a common view and narrative uh, that's that's super important uh, patrick if we circle back uh, to some of the points that 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 you made uh, in the beginning um alluding to the first standards and then evolving those thoughts that you did um into emerging technologies even uh, it it seems to me, at least, that that there, there's perhaps I don't know uh, two uh, two concurrent mindsets at play. Uh, one mindset is uh, how to evolve from current state, from where we are, and having an evolutionary kind of progression. And then you have uh, maybe a, a, if you call it an innovation mindset or a disruptive mindset. So what changes the game? And then maybe sometimes we position emerging technologies there. What do you see in terms of these different types of mindsets and, and what plays out in the change we are at the moment? Uh, how should leaders think about these mindsets and, and the neighbors around us? So, uh, yeah, thank you. I, I, I think it, it uh, all of this has been illustrated by the conversation we have had so far, because what, what, what comes very clearly, and we see it in the enterprise, uh, you don't change through technology. The first thing, and we, this was mentioned many times, uh, it, it's uh, you, you have to identify not only the social need, and, and they are huge, uh, from climate to inequalities, who are, there, there are many these days, uh, to the acceptability. That, that's something people have to know. What is acceptable? If you take COVID, what has it created? It has created, I take on the enterprise side, obviously, uh, the trust between employers and employees. Why didn't we have more work from home before? There was no trust. You, you mm -hmm. it was not socially accepted, accepted, and now it is. And now it opens uh, other question about work-life balance. Do I really have to commute? The answer is no. And then there is a trust between the employer and the employee, and then the trust between the enterprise and their clients. Yes, I can deliver, even in a different manner. So there was a, a, a social disruption, but that that, that, that you still can't escape, is, uh, escape sorry, this notion of acceptability. And, and here, that's where you see the debate. Uh, yeah. too easy to say between conservative and progressive, but this notion is very important. And then the second factor that you need to discuss is the economic viability. And, and if you continue on COVID, you say, okay, why, why will it last? because it's economically viable. I save on travel and expenses. And yes, I have to invest on the infrastructure, but I save on the commute time. So overall, my, the, my economic equation is working. And only third comes the question on technology. Okay, what do I need to make it happen? But at least you know what you're pursuing. And the start is not, and I think, busy uh, um, with Mark Emmanuel, Sally, uh, Steve, they, they've been very clear about this, and uh, mm. Gary, in his usual style, wants to put the frame on it. But uh, that that's the that's the point. So yes, uh, but you you can't escape these three steps, uh, my view, and uh, that's that's the type of conversation uh, we are having. Mm. Mm. And I was going to jump in on that one, if that's if that's okay as well. Go ahead, um, one other thing that sprung to mind as Patrick was talking is about other drivers of innovation. So I totally echo what Patrick was saying there, but it was also thinking about conscious leadership and as that as a response to conscious consumerism. So it's something I've talked about for a little while, but I think we're seeing a sea change in that now. You know, people want to buy from, work with, advocate organisations that have got that shared value proposition. So what you believe in personally and professionally, there's a real synchronisation between the two. And I think in the past, that sometimes, not always, it's been more 
more of an add-on rather than it's embedded. And I think what we've seen over the last few months, people have had the opportunity to pause and reflect. I think the word reset was mentioned earlier on in the conversation. And I think that applies yeah. to many things. And I think we're seeing a new driver of innovation from consumers more generally about actually, I want to know every step in the supply chain. I want to know what's yeah. happening. You know, the computers in the, in the laptop I'm using now, what happens at end of life? What are they going to, what purpose are they going to be put back for? I think we're all questioning yeah. things and there's a more mainstream trickle here. I think there's a, I'm going to use the word contagion. I'm going to reclaim it rather than being about COVID. Let, let's talk about something positive with it. But I think there's a contagion of change that's helping people to question, reevaluate and ask the right questions. And then make starting to make decisions and walk away from organizations, products and services that aren't aligned with, with their particular preferences. So I do well, think that's a really, really important point that's going to drive change um, into the future. I think there's a I don't want to use the word tipping point, really, but it, it, we are at that point now where it's yeah. actually affecting behavioral change. Yeah. I, if I could add one point to what Sally just said, because she's talking about change, I think this is one of the key points that we wrote in our report. Um, a lot of people um, and, and experts were talking about return to normal and stuff like that. But what we were looking at when we saw these kinds of different changes is every time an industry or even a company evolves in a certain kind of a way, they are creating a new modus operandi. And so a lot of times they're probably not going to go back. For example, in the last two months, uh, Microsoft actually published this recently. There have been more digital transformation projects that have happened than in the past two years. So these companies are not going to go back to operating the way that they were because their operating model doesn't work the same way anymore. And this isn't just for technology-based uh, companies. You have companies today like uh, Peloton, which makes the, uh, the user bikes, uh, which you can use at home. A lot of gyms are getting closed down right now. For example, Gold's Gym, which is very well known. I mean, Arnold Schwarzenegger, come on. Mm. Um, that gym's going away. It's, it's filed for bankruptcy. Mm. So if you're not getting that and now you're having a new kind of alternative towards it, what we're seeing is each and every industry is adapting in a different way. And the only thing that's actually constant is this change. You know, Mark and I, we've done this work in, in economics before. And mm. we said that the natural state of an economy is one of entropy. Equilibrium can occur. Mm. It's a temporary state of affairs. So that's why we need to kind of start thinking because it start, makes it a bit easier to lean into ambiguity that way. And that's the first step in mindset change. Uh -huh. And actually, Carrie, if I can build on what you say, because uh, Carrie and I, we've been working uh, for now almost a decade, which I almost hesitate to share, right? Um, I, I think that the, the conversation you were having on the value chain before is really where the transformation has happened. Um, one of the reasons why also with the work I do with, with the AI company that, that I co-founded, there was a lot of hesitation in people understanding why do we need AI? And most of the project were lost because there was no clarity inside of the organization. They wanted to have AI because they thought it was, uh, it was uh, a buzzword, but they hadn't done the diligence required to understand where this transformation could really happen. I think the, the last few months have forced organizations to truly engage on the assessment on these events on their, on their value chain. Now, there is no company that does not know what COVID has done to their, uh, to their production. So that form of reflection that was to some extent coerced almost in a wind tunnel through the events has truly allowed people to understand their value chain maybe was a design when the market was very different. And so now the transformation, the change management, the reshuffling of the organizational structure, the concept of trust, redefining power as well, is now a much easier conversation to make because we all felt that to some extent um, it, this was possible. And we, it's like somebody tip us off, we took a plunge, we were not planning, but once we're in, the only thing we can do is to adapt to the circumstances so I remember there was a quite interesting article a few years back about adaptability being the new competitive advantage, but it was like many of these HBR article, very aspirational, but the conversion rate from the article to the, to the action was really low. Now, I think from the experience of the practice in having taken the plunge, we have learned that the experimenting transforming is way less mystique and much more of the ability for organization to constantly innovate. So I think we're also learning that innovation is no longer just a buzzword, but it's a cultural mindset. Mm. Can, I, can I just kind of say something about the cultural mindset? Because I think there's something really important here. And, and, sure. and that's part of the, the kind of the human nature, particularly at an organizational level. And I always struggle when I mean when we mean organization, we mean people actually, don't we? 
but there's a kind of a block about failure and actually we need failure in, in order to learn. So we need to kind of move that barrier back as well in order to move through, take the lessons from COVID and from other big disruptions that we've seen through um, uh, recent decades and really build that into the way that we use technology in an appropriate way. And actually, I think that's one of the real big challenges that enterprise and governments have. You know, how do we accept failure? What level of failure is acceptable? How do we build that positively into our change programs? And one of the big things that I think underpins that, particularly from a technological perspective, is digital literacy. Is the digital literacy in our organisations at an appropriate level where we can make the right call about the right technologies? You know, those all seem to me to be critical issues about the way that we really embrace the potential benefits of new technologies. I think that's a good point, Steve. I think. Uh... In, in, in some industries, uh, clear, I think uh, clear leaders have emerged um, in that they've proven their dexterousness or their ability to quickly adapt, reframe the problem even, and then come into the market and into yeah, meeting their customers, even with new products and services in a, in a radically new context, right? Uh, how, how, how should leaders think about uh, uh, gaining or getting those characteristics of, of, of adaptability and uh, it boils down to many things like talent and culture, but how do you shape it? What's, what are the kind of main streams of thought you have there? Adaptability and, and, and uh, you know, transformational ability. I think we fro you froze there on my end, Steve. Yeah, so maybe I'll just quickly redirect the question to you, Sally. I, th I think one thing generally, not, not just for leaders in organisations, just thinking about education more generally, I think more support for people to help mm. them how to learn. We talk about smart technology all the time. I think we talk less about smart learning and smart education. Uh, and there's a process all around metacognition. And there's a step, mm. I literally just published something on this about how to be a better mentor and how to evolve your, your skills in that particular area. If we, you know, I think sometimes, again, there can be this thing that, you know, certain skills are set and you're born with them, but that's not the case we can help people through that particular process so helping people learn be more comfortable with ambiguity that steve mentioned earlier on as well incredibly important um to, so yeah there's a process and somebody's asked in the chat earlier i, I saw actually just at the beginning about opportunities yeah. and things one of the things i do with my nonprofit is all about guiding people through that process and pairing up with a mentor from a different background and again that's a great way to cross fertilize skills and build that confidence but for me yeah. amber dexterity i think that you were referring to andrea in organizations has to be underpinned by that quality with the people within it so they, they are absolutely synchronous so I, I couldn't agree more so helping people know how to learn and exposing them to those different examples and the, the importance of role models in that is absolutely key particularly yeah. when we're looking at certain areas within technology where we haven't got that depth and breadth of a diversity of experience Mm -hmm. And Emmanuel I can't help my thinking about the uh, the organization the the, the, the company you 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 run Emmanuel uh, Credit Agricole been around for many many years with a with a deep uh, a client relationship client centricity as core values to the bank uh, decentralized regional meeting you know at 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 uh, the level where they need to be right and then we have a an opportunity which could be maybe seen global and then organization wide how do you address these you know changes and opportunities in such a decentralized client-centric context uh, which you're doing so well how do you do that i mean the there, there is one thing which is quite a challenge to us which is the you know getting to the uncharted territories this is i mean when you are a decentralized organization tightly connected to the, you know, to the ground, to the people, uh, you know what you are, you know where you come from, and then, you know, taking the risk to go out with some leadership, exploring the uncharted market, you know, potential market is not something which is, I mean, this is quite a challenge. However, we, I mean, we, we know that we, we need to develop the, the empathy, the empathy for the technology, for the people, uh, my company is, I mean, the, the goal is to make that technology easy to access, an easygoing thing, 
so that the, the guys who are connecting to the market, connecting to the local companies, connecting to the farmer, the people, you know, mm. they can be relying on something which is best UX and something which is seamless, something you can trust, something that you can track, you know, and all the things we, we shared before with the blockchain and everything is part of that. However, as those guys, do they need to understand what blockchain is? Probably not. Uh, I mean, the, the mm. thing is, how this is delivering value into the you know the the, the trusted relationship they they have to uh, to 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 build with that society to be with that local territories uh, we heard so i mean you you mentioning that each people being some you know better future ability to learn ability to reflect on what we want to be um, but the organization the public the governments i mean there is so many barriers here there you know that it seems that locally each people is now you know finding out exploring kind of a now better future but globally speaking not at state level there's some other guy thinking about a different way to achieve that so mm. we will have to reconnect i don't know if you guys you have been you know working about what's going on with all those big territories eu uh, us china etc I mean, I'm very engaged in what EU is willing to build in terms, you know, the everything which is about cloud, everything which is it's not about security, it's about privacy, it's about protection, it's about social wealth, etc. I mean, we do trust the upper about security. We don't trust the upper about privacy, which is yeah. which is kind of a different stuff. Um, yeah. So this is where we are struggling today is we don't know how to reconnect the you know the global stuff we want to be global i mean each of us they want to be now being autonomous you know mm. mastering doing uh, moving on 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 our own but we mm. still want to see all the others globally and see mm. what they are going to do so that's kind of a paradox here and we are expecting so much about the you know the the regulators and all the global stuff to be helping us moving forward at the end, we think that the global company or company like Credit Record, where you're a big thing, we can mm. really help and we have a role mm. to play. Mm. Thank you. Mark, one of the questions that that, uh, that came in, I'll put this in the context of the fourth industrial revolution and maybe where we're heading into the future here. Digital literacy um, in 2020, um, what does that mean? In, sure. In perspective. That was uh that was very interesting, right? When uh, when also uh, uh, you know conversations were shaped by by Steve, by Sally, mm. uh, by Manuel. Now, right? They they take us into that direction. Um, I think it is the fact that today the expression of life has to take into account with some form of what they call. I use digital twin. Uh, I won't use it exactly in the same way that this uh, use in the technological spectrum, but I use it as a, as a metaphor, right? Mm -hmm. We're having this digital identity. We start thinking about the digital domain. We start mm -hmm. having the idea of digital sovereignty. And I think the conversation with Emmanuel about privacy in the EU, that's a form of digital sovereignty. Uh, what, how do we define the boundary when data is so intangible? And, mm -hmm. and futile, so to say. So I think the idea of digital literacy is the same that happened when we wanted people to get financial literacy because we wanted them to understand how to go into a bank and operate with a different form of financial instruments they had. So I think it's a language. I see this much more into what Sally was saying before, the opportunity to reshape the educational journey. I would love to see children understanding digital literacy to make sure that they are not necessarily creating a blurred space between life mm. and digital life being equivalent, I would feel uh, uh, so like concern if we don't have a way to understand that it's nothing more than an extension of the brain. We created a form of digital world, uh, but mm. we also have to understand that in the digital world, we don't have the same instincts and hunches because we have a much larger stakeholder basis to look after. It's not like when you're looking after your neighborhood and you have to be careful who you meet and, and not. So mm. that is for me what digital literacy really tends to be. And I think it's a degree of effort that starts maybe from the private sector. Yesterday during the UNGA, uh, one of the things I appreciated from one of my, my colleagues, when he said, the organization that are able to integrate the ethical conversation as part of their compliance, they're one mm -hmm. step ahead. Because especially large companies that work with so many suppliers, 
that can really help the supplier standardize a level up and, and make sure that through their partnership that they have in the supply chain, they can help them step up to maybe a challenge they wouldn't do otherwise. I think if we do the same apply to all of these education required for digital literacy, we're going to make sure that we're building a technology that works for us rather sure. than this constant idea about will we be able to defend ourselves from technology, which of sure. course is, 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 uh, is, uh, is a, is a lose-lose argument to start with. Sure. It's really interesting and um, also looking at um, the time where four minutes uh, to the top of the hour, this went far too too fast. Um, I want to I want to thank all panelists for your participation today uh, in this conversation. Uh, I just take a, a one one minute to to kind of reflect on uh, on the conversation. Uh, the asking the right questions. I think future thinking simplified obviously has to relate to asking the right questions and handing over to you, Patrick, for for a conclusion of all of this. I think you you uh, you started out by even asking the question around the purpose. I think the emerging technologies and the technology levers are part of the journey moving forward, the enablers, uh, and then we need to be contextualizing the purpose and the so what. What, uh, what do you see, um, Patrick, in terms of concluding all of these uh, interesting remarks from our panel today? And I know it's maybe a tricky question because we've had so much content here, but what, what do you see? No, exactly. And uh, this would be a disservice to this conversation to conclude. Uh, I hope we yes. are. I hope uh, you will exploit. Uh, we have about for ten more webinars. Uh, your day-to-day -day, uh, job. But, uh, no, there is more. That is rich. I mean, the, a lot of the fundamental themes have, have been exposed, and, and we could uh, set some perspective. So I would like just to highlight uh, two two things. Uh, wh one, which we didn't uh, evoke too much, but that is very important, is uh, once you start something, think of how you can scale. Because ultimately, for society, for the enterprise, uh, if you can't, uh, okay, nice to have, nice to show, but it won't move the needle. And, and we have so many, as it has been exposed, pressing challenges uh, that uh, this thought process has to be there from the beginning. And if you can't, kill her rapidly, that's the opposite. So that, that would be one thing. And the second that is more personal, personal but that has been evoked by, by all, all of us on the panel is digital inclusion. I think it's, a, it's not an education problem, it's not only a society problem, it is an enterprise. We speak of programming language. So it's yeah. a language, you, know, you have to learn the language you, and you can't leave people illiterate. And, and I think this is really fundamental uh, when you work in technology, uh, you have to pay attention. It's our collective responsibility to work on digital inclusion. So uh, thank, thank you for this opportunity and, uh, and the richness of the conversation. Thank you, Patrick. And uh, Emmanuel Sardé, thank you so much. Uh, Sally Leaves, thank you. Mark Esposito, good to have you on the panel. Thank you. Steve Wells, thank you for your thoughts and, and reflections. Carrie, so much. Thank you to you and Patrick also. Thank you for your contextualization and the, and the wrapping up here. To all of the attendees, I thank you for having spent the time uh, with us today. I, I, I hope you can get some of this with you uh, into today and, and moving forward into the future, uh, both for growth and for and for good. Uh, I am looking forward to continue the conversation uh, as we have many more go live panel discussions ahead of us. So stay tuned and uh, looking forward to meet you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.